Hello and welcome. You're listening to How She Really Does It at KDRT LP 95.7 FM. And this is Krem Motokaitis, How She Really Does It, where inspiration and possibility meet. Each week I bring on guests that can help inspire and empower you to see the windows of possibilities that may be in your own life. I bring on guests who are living it to teach it, who we can use them as examples, and who've also maybe created their own followings and examples of other people that they can bring and showcase with you. You can connect with me by going to my website at www.howshereallydoesit.com. You can sign up for my weekly newsletter, connect with me via Facebook, Twitter, or there's also a section for email. I'd love to hear from you. Live shows become podcasts on the sh- on the site, and you can also download them from iTunes. Simon Sinek has been cited as an inspiration by those around him. In one case, his friend moved from waitressing to Broadway. Simon teaches and or- teaches organizations how to inspire people. Simon and I will be discussing cl- how clients figure out the why of their business and helps them learn to inspire people and how it can affect their business and organization. Simon, hello and welcome. Hi, how are you? Good, thank you. So let's, I first would like to know, why do you do what you do? (laughs) Good question. Um, I wake up every single day with a single purpose. It's to inspire people to do the things that inspire them. Um, There's a statistic that over 90% of Americans go home at the end of the day uh, not feeling fulfilled by the work they do. Over Mm -hmm. 90%, can you believe that? Mm -hmm. And so I imagine a world in which that statistic is entirely reversed in which over 90% of us go home feeling entirely fulfilled by our work, inspired by the work that we do. And so that's what I've set out to do. Everything I do is designed to help advance that message and how everyone should uh, only do the things that inspire them. And, and how, do you, how do you help with the skeptics out there that go, well, that's, that's fine and dandy for you, but look at this economy that we're in. How can I possibly do it? I should be just thankful that I have a job. There's a huge difference between feeling, fulfill- feeling fulfilled and sort of having a job. Mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, this is, this is <laughs> the whole idea of, of, of uh, waking up every day and sort of doing something that fulfills you and going home at the end of the day fulfilled doesn't mean that, that those other factors aren't there. You mm-hmm. can still be grateful to have a job. You can still, you know, be uh, unhappy with some of the trappings of your job. But ultimately, is the work that the company is doing and is, is the work that you're doing uh, filling you emotionally and spiritually? Does it give you something to latch onto? And there's a huge difference also between being successful and feeling successful, Mm -hmm. right? I know a lot of people who make tons of money and they're, by all accounts, superficially Mm -hmm. very successful, but they don't feel it. There's something lacking in their lives. And and after they started to make lots of money, they would say that the feeling went away. And so they just keep trying to make more or, or get bigger, hoping that feeling will come back, but it doesn't. And conversely, I know plenty of people who never made it big, quote unquote, but they love their lives and they mm-hmm. have the sense of optimism and joy. And so, you know, the skeptics out there may, may, may only be measuring success one way. Mm-hmm. And so do you use that feeling to help guide you in projects that you do in launching your business? This my, my why, you mean? Yes. My why is central to everything that I do. Mm-hmm. I mean... Um, I will not uh, do something if it doesn't help advance my cause. Um, uh, you know, my why came from a very personal experience. I started a, um, a business, you know, eight or nine years ago, um, and my story is not that different from any other uh, small business owner or entrepreneur. Um, you know, I had a vision of being able to do it better and build a better mousetrap, and I set up and took the risk on my own, which is an entirely crazy experience <laughs> because, you know, over 90% of all new uh, businesses fail in the first three years. So you mm-hmm. have to be a little bit insane or driven by some passion to do something big to even want to, you, know, uh, you know, do something with a, where the statistical chance of failure is overwhelming. I mean, you have to be insane. Mm-hmm. And so my story is no different. I, I went off with full of excitement and passion for wanting to do something bigger and better, and um, the first three years were good. I mean, we did pretty well the first year. We did pretty well the second year. And we survived. I beat the statistic. You know, mm-hmm. after three years, we stayed in business and joined a very small group of people who could claim that they stayed in business for more than three years. The problem was, my fourth year, I completely lost my passion for what I was doing. Superficially, things looked fine. You know, I owned a business, and I made a living, and I had fantastic clients, and we did great work, and yet I didn't feel it. Mm -hmm. And if I talked about it, it sort of sounded silly because superficially things were fine. And when I attempted to talk to people or read books about how to do things better, um, all it did was make me feel even worse because when I would read these things or talk to people, all I did was hear the things that I was doing wrong or that I wasn't doing. 
And I started to become paranoid, and I started to worry that I was going to go bankrupt and lose everything and get evicted. I mean, it was really a dark, dark place in my life. And it was, I was about the furthest from feeling fulfilled. And it was this discovery of this thing called the why. I learned that all organizations and even our own careers function on three levels, what we do, how we do it, and why we do it. Everybody knows what they do. Mm -hmm. Some people know how they do it. These are the things we think make us different or special or better. But very few people know why they do what they do. And by why, I don't mean to make money. I mean, what's your purpose? What's your cause? What's your belief? Why does your company exist? Why are you bothering? Why are you putting in all of that energy? For what? Why do you get out of bed in the morning? Why should anyone care? And that was the question I did not know the answer to. And I realized that I knew the other two, and I had to find this third piece. And I became obsessed with answering this question. And I learned a way to find your why. And that's when I learned my why is to inspire people to do things that inspire them. And together, we can change the world. And set out to do that. I literally stopped talking about what I do. I only started talking about what I believed and the world that I wanted to build. And instantaneously, my passion was restored. And it was so exciting, I shared it with my friends. Because that's what you do, right? Mm-hmm. You share good things with your friends. I shared it with my friends. And my friends started making crazy life decisions. Right? And their careers started to, to grow as well. And uh, my friends invited me to their homes and encouraged me to talk to their friends, which I did. I would go to someone's home and I would talk to a group of their friends sitting on the couch. And people just kept inviting me and inviting me and inviting me. And before you know it, things started to completely change. So I've made a decision in my life, which is if this thing is so powerful, you know, I, I would be the, the, the most selfish person in the world to keep it to myself. So I've decided to devote my life to sharing this idea with anyone who will listen. And, um, and so, like I said, my, my, my story is, is, is not that different. It, it's, it was born out of reality. It was born out of a very personal uh, experience. And, uh, and now I'm, I'm sort of, it's changed the course of my life. And so, Simon, when you talk about you built this company and you beat the odds and you were successful in the terms of, you know, the American standards. Sure. But you didn't know your why. Is that why there was this... Um, Emptiness. Emptiness. Yeah, for sure. I mean, when you start a business, it's, you, you know, this is how we talk about it. You say, I, I'm doing what I'm passionate about. Mm-hmm. Well, what are you passionate about? Well, you know, you, you ask most young entrepreneurs, you know, what does your company do that, you know, provides some IT solution that does this or that? Or, you know, I mean, they, they tell you what the company does. They're not really passionate for that. I mean, that's not your childhood dream, mm-hmm. you know? I wanted to be an astronaut when I was a kid, you know? Mm-hmm. Um, and, uh, uh, and so it's, it, it's what was missing. Was, it was something that was in my gut when I started the business. Like, I could feel it. That's what drove me. Mm-hmm. But the problem is, how do you keep that feeling, that passion alive? The problem is, if you can't put it into words, it's not actionable. The problem is, if, it's, can't, if you can't put it into words, you can't remind yourself about it. When, the problem is, if you can't put it into words, you can't tell other people about it. It's only as good as the feeling when the feeling is there. But what happens when the feeling goes away? And so... Uh, that was the need to put the why down. That was the need to put the why into words. I used to have the feeling, but how do I get that feeling back? It was intangible. It was amorphous. So by, by articulating your why, you're taking that which is a feeling. You're taking that which is intangible but drives you and gives you a sense of fulfillment, and you put it into words so that you can create it, look for it, find it, build it, and share it. So that feeling that you had in the beginning, that was your driving force. And are you saying that that's a similar feeling as... It's the same feeling. It's okay. the same feeling. It's the same feeling. All of us have a sense of our why. We call it our gut, right? Mm-hmm. That's what we call it. We call it our passion. We call it... It's in our heart. It's in our blood. It's in our bones. It's in our soul. I mean, we ascribe it to all different parts of our body. But the problem is we still can't put it into words. You know, it's, it's the same uh, problem when you ask somebody, why do you love your husband or why do you love your wife? That's a hard question. Uh, I don't know, most people say. You know? mm-hmm. And then they start rationalizing. You know, she's smart, she's fun, you know, she's always been there for me, right? I mean, we're just rationalizing. But mm-hmm. at the end of the day, the feeling we have towards another person has nothing to do with those things. Somebody's disorganized, and they forget your birthday, and yet you still love them deeply, you know? And like, why is that? They're not perfect. In fact, they're the furthest thing from it, and yet you love them. And it's a feeling that we have. And the problem is that feeling exists in the part of the brain called the limbic brain. And the limbic brain controls all our behavior, all our, decision make, all our decision making. It also controls all of our feelings, like love and passion and loyalty and trust, but it doesn't control language. And so it's hard to put these things into words. And so we ascribe them to different parts of the body or make things up and, you know, they aren't really there. We talk around them, but we don't actually talk about them. 
so the ability to put your why into words is, is, is has profound impact. So is that that the putting the why into words connecting that limbic brain together? Mm-hmm. Is that what's mm-hmm. happening? That's what that's what's happening. It's exactly right. What you're able to do is put words to that feeling. What you're able to do is is uh, um, identify in hard words what that thing is. You know, it's it's like anything you tell somebody to do, right? If I ask you to to go out, you know, have you ever noticed here? Have you ever noticed that the only people who tell you to do what you love are people who are already doing what they mm-hmm. love, and the only people who ever tell you do what you're passionate about or do what you're passionate for are people who are already doing what they're passionate for? Like, we know that. That's not the problem. The problem is, what am I passionate for? The problem is, what do I love? That, that's the issue. The problem isn't mm-hmm. the, the philosophy of doing what you love. The problem is, how do I know and how do I find it? And, and the reason is because these things that we love or that we're passionate for, they're in us, and when we're doing them, we know they're there because we've all been in situations, professionally or personally, that it doesn't matter how hard the work is, it doesn't matter how hard the situation is, every moment is like amazing, fulfilling, incredible. And yet there are also times where we do the same activities, the same work, and yet it just doesn't feel the way it used to. And so, you know, if I ask you to go get something, you know, if I say to you, can you get me my favorite thing to eat? And you say, well, what is it? You'd be like, well, it's my favorite thing to eat. <laughs> you say, yeah, but h- how am I going to get it for you? You'd be like, I love eating it. Don't you understand? Well, how do you know that you love eating? What does it taste like? It tastes incredible. What do you keep bugging me for? Go get it for me. Mm-hmm. You have no, you're going to go to the supermarket, and you have no clue what you're going to buy, mm-hmm. right? If I say to you, can you go buy something that's filled with butter? Because I love that sort of umami sort of buttery feeling and 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 make sure that it's oozing with chocolate right because it's that experience of sort of the gooey chocolate buttery that uh, quite frankly is the one thing that that is amazing for me and you can actually go to the supermarket and buy things that may not be the exact same thing but there's many 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 things you could now give me that would give me that that experience and it's not this sort of product based thing go get me a chocolate cake because then my whole life I have to eat chocolate cake. How boring. Mm-hmm. By giving people the parameters, understanding why, what it is that makes up the things that you love, means not only can you more specifically ask for it, but others know what to give it to you. And it also means that you can identify it when you see it before having to taste it and be like, oh, this doesn't taste good. You know, you don't have to taste it first. You know before you've even tried it you're going to love it mm-hmm. because you understand the conditions that drive that feeling. That's what the why is. And so when people and like my listeners who, you know, I bring on these great guests who have just achieved and who get, you know, and, and I've, I've read some stuff where you say, gosh, I'm very fortunate for some of the people that I get to meet and to hang out with. Mm. But one of the things about the show is it's not only important to inspire, but also to see the possibilities. So you're a window of possibility, but the steps to get there, you know, how can I transform this so that how can I be inspired for me? Yeah. You know, um. You know, I'm, uh, let's, so here, I'm, I'll, I'll, I'll be candid. You know, I'm cynical about the whole me, me, me thing first, mm-hmm. right? Because what that ends up doing is creating a bunch of people running around who are only preoccupied with their own happiness, at the, sometimes at the expense of others, or at least ignorant of or oblivious of others. Mm-hmm. And although it's good to feel good, it's better to make somebody next to you feel good. And what I've learned is that there's an irony to it, which is, um, which is absolutely, you have to preoccupi- preoccupy yourself with your own why first. Unless you're inspired, unless you're fulfilled, unless you're optimistic, then you are of no value to anybody else in the world. Once that is done, then it is your responsibility to give what you have away, mm-hmm. to give away that sense of feeling, to lead others to find that, that idea through your products, through your services, through your personality, through yourself, your friendships so that you inspire those around you and it is that act of sharing your why that reinforces your own why it is the act of giving your why away that allows you to maintain that feeling that you that you have and so um so starting so i I just want to be clear that that there is a responsibility that once you Mm -hmm. find your why it doesn't end there Mm -hmm. you now have the responsibility to share and give and inspire those around you and that's what keeps the that, that sense of fulfillment alive. It's being of so service. The question is, yes, yes, absolutely. I mean, Viktor Frankl, the guy who mm-hmm. wrote Man's Search for Meaning, which is perhaps the most important book anyone should ever read ever, 
um, for personal or for business reasons, um, uh, he said you can find your purpose one of three ways. You can find it through a loving relationship, you can a deep loving relationship. You can find it through service, or you can find it through suffering. And what <laughs> happens very often for, for many of us is we go through one of these three experiences, and it reveals to us. It's not that that, that uh, experience per se creates the why. It's that those experiences reveal the why. I mean, you look back at how my why was revealed to me. It came through suffering. It came through a dark period. I never want to relive it, but I'm immensely grateful that I did because I wouldn't be where I am now if it weren't for that. And so it's to understand and see that all the things that we go through in our life are lessons, things that may reveal something to us. And truly the way to find your why is to look backwards, not to look forwards. It's not to go forwards and say, who do I want to be? It's to look backwards and say, who am I? And you look at, you, you know, your why is fully formed probably by the time you're 18 or 19 or 20. It is the sum combination of the lessons you learn from your parents, from your teachers, from the experiences you had growing up. It's that sum total of experiences that, that, that formed who you are. Mm-hmm. And, and so that's the way you do it, which is you go back and find the times in your life that you absolutely loved what you were doing. Here, I have an idea. Why don't, we just, why don't I just show you? Why don't we just show your, your, your listeners? I'll do it okay. with you. Okay. So, so tell me your resume backwards really quickly. Sort of tell me what you're doing now and then go backwards for me. Okay, so I host the show and I do life coaching. And, um, and I also, yeah, that's what I do. Before that, I was a tenured professor at a college and I was an athletic coach and I taught health. Um, and before that I was a collegiate athlete and I went, I was a national champ and, but before that I s- swimmer for 15 years. That was my biggest okay. thing. And then, be- bef- and, and, um, and when you were teaching, mm-hmm. uh, did you, did you, did you love that experience? Did you love that experience? Did you love being a teacher? Um, the answer can be no. No. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and then, uh, so clearly you, tra- you tried to do something else. So mm-hmm. which of the jobs that you have or you have had can you say that you absolutely loved? Oh, well, I've always loved being a coach and a teacher. Okay. There are just certain environments that I prefer. How's Got it. That? So um, tell me about, uh, uh, as a coach, Tell me one of your favorite experiences, or, the, or, or one of your uh, one of the people you've worked with that was your just like you loved it. If every person you coach could be like this, you loved working with that person. Can you think of one? Gosh, there's so many. Um, give me one. Just give your absolute favorite. Like like if if every single person you coached was exactly like this person, you'd have the best life in the world. Um, you got one? Yeah, I've got one. Okay, uh, what about them? is so great. What is it about them that you love working with them? I loved working with them, and, and I love building the relationship with them. I love building, you know, where there was a trust. At first it was like, who are you? And I'm choosing you to be my leader, but do I really want you to be my leader? And then building a relationship where there was a trust, going through times that there was struggle and overcoming that. That's probably one of my favorite parts of coaching, whether it's life coaching or athletic coaching. Um, and then, um, and then seeing them see what's possible for them. And now going back to when you were an athlete, Mm -hmm. right? Uh, tell me about, um, a race that is, that, that, that you carry with you to this day. Like one of these experiences that you had that was just, it was your, like whether you won the race or lost the race, it doesn't matter. But tell me about one of the ones that you carry with you to this day. Um, the, there were, there are two, but with the one, one that I'll share is, um, I find that this is when I became a national champ and um, it was something that didn't even seem a possibility when I first went to college. And then I, uh, I got a little closer to that goal. And then by my junior year, I was like, well, this is what I want and let's see if I can achieve it. And, um, and then going through and achieving it and realizing that I created something that I wanted in my life and that I was still the same person. I was no different Mm -hmm. where when I was 18, I thought I'd be different when I achieved a certain goal. But at this point I realized I was no different, but that I had the wherewithal to create something. Mm -hmm. And, and tell me more about that. Tell you more about that. Um, that, tell me specifically about the race. Tell me specifically about, you said there was one race that changed it. Well, yeah. So that, so that race, um, you know, I trained really hard. I didn't share that goal with anybody because I didn't want to lose face 
You know, I didn't want to, people to laugh at me later and say, oh, see, who, who did you think you were to try to be a national champ? Um, and I was in the finals, and um, I got up on the race, and I swam, and I, <laughs> it was a two-minute race, and I had a huge dialogue going on in my head. And at lap five, I go, you know what? It's okay. I'm a junior. I can come back next year. It's okay. I, I'll just, I'll let this one go. And um, I touched the wall. I pushed off, and I said something that I can't say on the air. And, um, and I pushed off, and I just said, forget it. You know, I'm here. Let's just see what I can do. Whether I win or lose, it doesn't matter, but let's just see what I can do. And apparently, this is before flip cameras and everything, so apparently it was a really exciting race. And I touched the wall, and there were two other people. I won with seven one hundreds. And, you know, five yards on to the wall, nobody knew who was going to win. But I almost gave up, you know, a year's worth of training or even more. I mean, at that point, it was what, 13 years of training. But um, I almost gave up on myself and my goal. And I had huge dialogues. And again, it came down to my own beliefs of what I was capable of. And then I just tossed it aside and um, put my head down and just let go of what was going to happen and just put my best effort forward. And tell me your earliest childhood memory of happiness. <sighs> your, earliest, your earliest happy memory as a child, specific, your earliest specific memory uh, of happiness as a child. My earliest happy memory. Um, I would say it was like when I was, like the thing that comes to me is when I was 10, and it was just walking on the pool deck, and my coach was so happy to see me. That's your, that's your earliest I happy childhood memory? Simon, I didn't have like the greatest childhood. Um, okay. <laughs> That's okay. So tell me. So so I go. So let's change it then. Tell me your earliest memory. My your earliest, earliest childhood memory. Specific. Specific. My earliest childhood memory. Um, okay, being Don't in edit kindergarten. We're on air. No, <laughs> no. <let's go. laughs> no, being in kindergarten and being really free in the kindergarten playground, and I'm half Korean, and at that time I was bilingual. And so I used to love to sing this Korean song. It was about a bunny, and I couldn't sing it now because I don't remember it. But, and I would just go around in the playground, and I would sing this song. And it was just happy and free, and I didn't care that I was different than anybody else. I was just happy in my little world on the playground. Mm -hmm. So here's where your why exists, right? Do you see the, do you see the pattern in just a few examples you've told me? <laughs> Not with the kindergarten thing, but go ahead. So... Um, you are at your best when you stop doing things for other people and you start doing them for yourself, right? Mm -hmm. You are at your best when you stop caring about what other people think. And if you go back to the swimming example, right, this defining moment in your life where you didn't want to tell anybody about your goal for fear that if you didn't reach it, you would be shamed, right? Mm -hmm. um, but and when you're in the pool, you're even thinking, you know what, I don't really need this. I can, you're, giving all your, you're giving yourself excuses, mm -hmm. you know? And then only when you let go and you realize that you weren't swimming for anyone else but yourself. Mm -hmm. You weren't swimming for your school. It was for you. And you could be in your own mind, in your own little world, all by yourself, and swim your heart out for no other reason than for yourself. Did you win? Mm -hmm. And when you were this happy kid, and by the way, I asked for the earliest happy memory, and you said that you didn't have a happy childhood memory, and then I asked you for anything, and you actually gave me a happy one. Mm-hmm. And you talked about being this little bit of a misfit kid, you know, mm -hmm. who found great joy when you could sing this song that no one could understand but that you liked. Mm -hmm. And it was when you, and you said, and I didn't care. Mm -hmm. And it was when you were able to, to disconnect from the fact that the life you lived had nothing to do with anybody else but yourself, that you could enjoy your own company and you were living for, for yourself. You could, you as other people may have not sung the song for fear of looking foolish or being made fun of, but you didn't care because it made you happy. And it's that pattern that to do things for yourself is more important than doing things for anybody else. And the irony is when you do things like that, when you do it because you love it, because you are driven by it, then you actually will be able to contribute even greater to other people. How am I doing? No, that's great. I have tears in my eyes. Um, <laughs> Not what I expected today, but... Um. So, by the way, the fact that you have tears in your eyes means that we're hitting right on the why, because the why exists in your limbic brain, the part of the brain that controls emotions. And so when you talk from the why or to the why, what ends up happening is that person has an emotional response. In your case, it's tears. They're not tears of sadness. They're tears of overwhelm, like um, you're describing who I am. Mm -hmm. This is me. 
this is my why. And some people, like if you've ever heard a speech where you got goosebumps, you know, if you, can, if you watch the I Have a Dream speech by Martin Luther King, mm-hmm. and if you get goosebumps, that's because he's talking about something that taps your why. That's why you had an emotional response like goosebumps. That's why we well up when we see things that we find beautiful. I well up when I watch video of the space shuttle taking off because to me that is the most inspiring thing in the world. It's just It's amazing. And that level of intensity. And so the fact that you're welling up means that we're right in the right sphere. And so your why, when somebody says, what do you do? You're not a coach. You're not on the radio. You live your life to prove to people that only when they let go of all of their fears and anxieties what other people think, and only when they do things for themselves, will they actually achieve everything that they've ever set out to achieve. And you've set out in any way, shape, or form, whether it's talking on the radio or being a coach or a writer, it doesn't matter what you do. What matters is that everything you do is driven by this idea that people do things for themselves for no other reason than it brings them happiness. And I would bet money that all of your best clients as a coach, what they have learned from you is the things they do, they do for themselves, and they shouldn't worry about the metrics or how other people perceive them. (laughs) No, that is what I teach. That is... That and you and I have never met before. It's like a magic trick. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> no wonder people are inviting you into their homes. <laughs> yeah. And the point is, you, the original question was, Simon, how do people find their why? Uh-huh. Right? And I decided to show you instead of just tell you. And, but the, what you see was, and I'm good at it because I'm practiced. Uh-huh. Right? Anybody can do what I just did. You just need more data. The only reason I'm... I'm able to do it quickly on the radio is because I do it all the time and I'm just more practiced. It used to take me much longer, mm-hmm. right? I'm just, and so it's just a practice thing. It's like riding a bicycle. You get good at it, right? Yeah. So uh, others do the same thing, which is go backwards in your life. Find the times that you loved what you were doing. And more importantly, ask yourself, what was it about that experience that I loved? And be as specific as you can, both about the experience and about what you loved. And just go and write and write and talk and talk and talk until you have nothing else to give. I don't, because I asked you, what was it about that? And you told me, I said, well, what was it about those things? And you told me, I said, okay, tell me more. And you said, uh, and only when you have no more did it start to get interesting, right? Mm -hmm. And if you do that enough times, if you have enough evidence, and you start to find there are commonalities, I was able to link a childhood experience to something you had as a swimmer, meaning we are you know, we are a product of our environment. We are products of our own upbringing. So you can go back very, very far. You were in kindergarten when you were singing these songs. Mm-hmm. And yet that is who you are today. No, that's re- I mean, it's, it's very, very interesting. And I appreciate doing, you know, an example or like a case study because that, that helps for me at least. Stories help g- get the message out more. Yeah. Um, I would, by the way, now you have to remind yourself. Remember I told you part of it was not just identifying your why, Uh but talking about it and giving it away, Mm -hmm. because that's what reinforces it. So you said the little Korean song that you sang was about a bunny, is that what you said? Mm -hmm. Okay, I want you to go buy a little toy bunny. It can be a fluffy one, it can be a ceramic one, it doesn't matter to me. Go buy yourself a little bunny and put it on your desk. Okay? And that little bunny is to remind you that you live your life for no one else but yourself. And the things that bring you joy are the things that you do. That's what that bunny does. It's a tangible reminder of something that lives inside you that is intangible. It is a tangible reminder of what you're passionate about and what you love. And now, because you're reminded by it, now because you can put it into words, now you can do it, look for it, find the opportunities to share it, talk about it. You can action it much easier, and other people know how to help you because they know what drives you. And that bunny is simply to remind you never to forget it. So the days that are hard, the days you forget it, the days you're stuck in the grind, you look at the bunny and you remind yourself. So I'm, I'm a little confused because I always thought my why was to help people see their possibilities and, uh-huh. and, and, and in a nonconformist way, right? And so I just need to help verbalize this one second is that um, it makes sense because once I threw away other people's expectations or what other people thought, yeah. the results happened for me. Right. And, and, that, and that is very, when I go through my story of my life, very right. so often. And one of the things when I work with my clients or with athletes, it's like, let go of the story. Don't worry about other people. Just yeah. focus in on yourself. Yes. 
And is, so is that how you're talking when earlier you were talking about the me, you know, not, yeah. and, and it's finding. So here's me getting down to my me. Right. Here's yeah. my story. Here's my whatever my pain. And here's what's happened. And then here's how I go and use that to serve other people. Is that what you're talking about? Uh, you know, the, what you described as your why doesn't give you goosebumps, does it? To help people find their possibility. I mean, does that give you goosebumps every time you say it? No. Exactly. In other words, it's not deep enough. It's still rational. It's mm -hmm. still you attempting to describe the work that you do rather than who you are and the contribution you make, right? The fact that you weld up with tears and the fact that from this point on when you talk about what we are discussing here, you will give yourself goosebumps over and over and over and over and over is because it's deeper, mm -hmm. right? And most people who are a little bit introspective can come up with part of their why. A good why is made up of two pieces. What do you do and why should I care, right? And mm -hmm. so... I, I always write it as if it's a social cause. To blank, so that blank, right? And most people who are a little bit on, uh, introspective can easily come up with the second part, so that blank. And you did. You said to help people und or reveal their possibilities, right? Mm -hmm. But my question is, although that may be the impact that you have, my question is, what's your contribution, right? So that's the actionable part, to blank, so that blank. You have the so that, but what's the to blank? And now it's to, and whatever words, you can play with the words, but the thought is, is, is to inspire people or show people with that when they uh, l live their lives for themselves and let go of what those people think so that they can achieve their greatest possibilities or reveal their possibilities. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. Now you have an impact and a contribution to mm -hmm. blank so that blank. And again, you can go with, play with the words and practice and find out what, what comes out easiest. You know, it's a, it's, it is a process. Um, and it, re it does require practice, but ultimately, you've always had the second part, your, which is your impact. But now, now what we know is your contribution, and your contribution is not only more specific, it's more actionable. Because there's many, many, many ways you can help people, you know, reveal their, po their, their potential. Uh -huh. you know? uh, I mean, that was the Bill Gates as well. He wanted to help people be more productive so they could achieve their greatest potential. Mm -hmm. You see? So... Um, so the, it's, it's not as actionable, though. Although it's true, it's not deep enough. And, and so what is your little icon or metaphor that you use to remind you? Um, I'm, I'm absolutely uh, fascinated by flight. You know, okay. um, for me, uh, uh, the, the symbol of the airplane is, is the thing that uh, uh, reminds me um, that, you know, to, the, the whole theory of flight, the miracle of flight, they had to look up and imagine. It, the, the symbol of the airplane to me is, is, is so is so powerful. And you know, as a little kid, I went to space camp, and I dreamed of being an astronaut. And I had pictures of planes on my wall, you know. And I mean, this this is sort of this is a common theme in my life. And on my desk, I have a, multiple little model airplanes. And on my wall, I have tons of airplanes. And in my bedroom, I have two huge model airplanes. And um, and I'm surrounded by all kinds of other th stuff that, as well. You know, I'm surrounded by you know, I, I do a lot of work with the military, mm -hmm. and I'm 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 grateful that the Air Force has invited me in to work with them. And uh, you know, I get a lot of I get get up in a lot of gifts and things and plaques and stuff from companies that I work with, and they all go into a little box and a little basket, right? 100% mm -hmm. of all the things that the the military has ever given to me, all hangs on the wall, because <laughs> because that stuff inspires me. Mm -hmm. And and to serve people who serve us, the concept of service. Mm -hmm. And the, the concept of giving something away for no other reason than because they believe in something, that concept, that, 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 that concept of service, to me, is, it reminds me. And I'll tell you a story. I had the great honor of going, uh, getting an invitation to visit Ramstein Air Force Base uh, January of this year. And I was there at Ramstein for about a week. And while there, part of my tour, you know, almost all the troops that go to or come home from the Middle East stop through Ramstein. And part of my tour was going through the facility that processes the wounded warriors uh, before they come home. And these are the ones who get put on the big C-17 cargo planes with doctors. You know, if necessary, they can perform, you know, surgeries on these planes. But basically, they're in stable condition enough they can be now transported home to a hospital at home, right? Mm -hmm. And part of my tour, I got to go through the facility, and we got to, I got to stand there and watch them loading up the wounded warriors on their way home. Some of them were ambulatory. They could walk themselves. Some of them were carried on stretchers. 
fortunately, the plane I saw, no one was on uh, life support. Anyway, we stood in the C-17 with the, with the you know, the, those huge big cargo planes with a whole door at the whole back of the plane opens up into a ramp. So I had to just stand in the inside of the plane as, as, they, as I watched them load them up, uh, all of the people carrying the, the, uh, these wounded men and women as they put their stretchers on these sort of racks inside the airplane. And it's overwhelming. It's overwhelming uh, to, to be a part of this. And I didn't ask permission, and I just stepped forward and went up to every single soldier on that uh, plane and stuck my hand out and said the exact same thing to everyone else. I said, I'm a civilian, I'm visiting from back home, and I just wanted to say thank you to you for what you do for us. And I shook their hand and I paid them a token of inspiration. I give out these tokens of, ins of inspiration to those who inspire me. Mm -hmm. And I paid each one of them a token of inspiration and went down to each one. I'm a civilian, I'm from back home, I just want to say thank you to you for what you do for us. Paid them a token. And there was this one young kid who was on a stretcher. He was strapped in underneath a blanket. He had an oxygen mask on, and he had a hole, a tube coming out of every hole in his body. You know, he was just covered in tubes and oxygen. And I looked down to him and said, I'm from back home. Um, I'm just visiting, and I wanted to say thank you to you for what you do for us. And I held up my token of inspiration, and I said, I have this for you, and I'll give it to someone else to hold for you, I said. And he didn't say a word to me, and his hand came out from underneath the blanket. Just if you imagine lying on your back and you just stick your hand out the side mm -hmm. of the blanket, and this hand comes out the side of the blanket, and I put the token in his hand, and he grips it tight and puts his hand back under the blanket. Needless to say, I was crying, mm -hmm. right? He never said a word to me. And when you understand the sacrifice that people make for no other reason than because they believe in something, it changes you. And so the days that I think, oh, I'm too tired to do something, or the day that I complain because my flight got delayed because <laughs> I have to go to some speaking thing, like, how dare I? You know? How dare I? And I realize that what we all think that we're doing, the sacrifices that we think we're making, we ain't doing nothing. And so that if we do a little bit more than we think that we're capable of, like, I'm not saying we all have to do what these brave young men and women do for us, but if we just remember that if we do a little more, the impact that we can have is profound. It's profound. And so, you know, <laughs> it's, it's, it, those are the things that inspire me. Those are the stories that if I, if I keep telling those stories, then I make sure to keep those symbols around me, that I'll be constantly reminded so I will not forget. I will net not get sucked into the weeds. I will not get, you know, sucked into worrying about the, the daily grind because I remember these stories. This mm -hmm. is why I hang these pictures. This is why I hang these plaques on my wall, because they remind me of, of, of what, that what others do is so much greater than what I do. And so if I can contribute in one small way, then my goodness, if we all contributed in one small way, imagine the world we live in. And the only way that every single one of us can go home feeling fulfilled by the work that we do is if each of us contributes in some small way to ensuring that others can. In other words, you cannot go home fulfilled at the end of your day unless others in your office help you feel that way. You even said it. You love teaching. You just didn't love all the environments in which you taught. Well, imagine if everyone came to work committed to helping make the environment a one in which others went home to feel fulfilled at the end of their day. Mm -hmm. Imagine how they would feel at the end of their day. That's the point. We are social animals. We thrive when we are amongst people who believe what we believe. We do well. We feel safe when we are around people who believe what we believe. When we believe, when others believe what we believe, trust is built. Trust is a feeling. Trust is a human experience. And so the more we express what we believe what we believe, the more we find those who believe what we believe, the more disciplined we become about only working with those who believe what we believe, the more likely we are to build trust to live in communities in which we feel safe and comfortable and are willing to take risks only because we have the confidence that if we fall or if we fail, that those around us will help us up so that we can try again. Absent trust, absent being amongst people who believe what we believe, we will not take risks, or if we do and if we fall, no one will be there to pick us up. And how does one do that when they may work for an organization that doesn't help pick people up? So what can, what can that person do? What contribution can they make to make it better? Can somebody lower on the chain in the hierarchy of the business 
do something? It has nothing to do with your title okay. or your rank. The only thing that title or rank does means the decisions you make have bigger influence. You know, the decision that a president makes influences a whole company or a whole country, right? The decision that uh, a, a, a division manager makes may only influence 10 people. Do not concern yourself with what the people above you are doing. Do mm-hmm. not concern yourself with impacting things that you cannot impact. Stop complaining about what the company does wrong. You cannot correct that. You can impact the things that you can impact, so do so. Stop whining about what's going on above you and start worrying about what's going on below you. And if you're the receptionist, stop worrying about what the president is doing or your boss is doing. How are you talking to the people who are calling, Mm -hmm. right? You have impact over every single person who calls in. What are you doing for them? Influence and impact. The, the sphere in which you can influence an impact. If, you, if three people work for you, how do those three, po- th- those three people feel when they go home at the end of the day? If you're a flight attendant, don't worry about what the airline is doing. Worry about what the other crew members are doing and worry about what the passengers are doing. You can go home at the end of the day knowing that you have fulfilled 150 people's lives simply because you were nice to them. Don't worry how the airline is mistreating you and use it as an excuse to mistreat other people. We all love to blame somebody mm-hmm. above us for the fact that somebody criticized us. You know, I, I had that once. I had such a terrible time on, a, on, a, on an airline once, and I started talking to the flight <laughs> attendant, and she started giving me words. She says, well, I want my vacation back, and, I want my, and she started telling me about the company, I, and I slowed her down. I said, you, you realize you and I are on the same team, right? You realize that we are both subject to the ills of the company. I've got to sit on this plane that hasn't been repaired and has ugly seats and is uncomfortable and has no food. Like, I'm with you there, right? So why don't you and I work together, and I can make your day at work a lot better, and you can make my trip a lot easier. That's the influence that you and I have over each other. So we're probably better as partners. That's the point. Influence the sphere in which you can influence, and don't worry about those above you. How did she react to your comments? She she backed down (laughs) instantly. And, And that, you know what, thank you for that, because... That, that I think will help people as they go to work. What, what can I control and where do I want to spend my energy? You choose to get inspired by people and then that inspires you to spend your energy or you could go and look at all the things that are wrong in the world and let, let that take you down and then you may not want to get up. Is that, isn't that what you're saying? Look, misery loves company, right? Mm-hmm. And the more we complain, the more we attract people who share our complaints and share our miseries. But optimism attracts optimism. The more you talk about what's good, you'll attract people who agree with you that those things are pretty good. And even in a bad economy, like you said before, Mm -hmm. right, we're talking about how 10% or 9% of America is unemployed right now, right? This is awful. Worst unemployment in years, okay? Mm -hmm. The way I look at it is we got 90% employment. Mm -hmm. We got 90% employment. Now, absolutely, we want to get that number up to 95 or 96%, but we got 90% employment. So what are we doing at work for 90% of our population that does have a job to make them go home feeling fulfilled at the end of the day? And absolutely get that number up to 96%. Mm-hmm. Well, because if we focus on the lack, isn't that going to be draining for us and we're going to hinder our creativity and figure out how to solve the problem because we're just fondling what the problem is? By focusing on the negative, we're reminding ourselves what's negative. Here, mm-hmm. the human brain cannot negate things. I'll show you. You ready? Mm-hmm. Don't think of an elephant. <laughs> oh, well, too bad. Right? Uh You can't tell people not to do things. You can only tell people to do things. Right? So when we focus on the negatives, all we're doing is reminding ourselves of stuff we don't like. Well, you shouldn't worry about what you hate at work. So what are we talking about? What you hate at work. Right? What you should focus on is about what you love at work. What you should focus on is what you love in your life. You see? It's those simple instructions by telling people to do things rather than telling them not to do things that has profound impact for the very simple reason that you can't tell the human brain not to do something. That's all. And yet we spend more time telling people not to do things than we do to do things. Have you ever noticed that we have a verb to react, but we have no verb to proact? You can only be proactive. That's a state of mind. That's not doing anything. So when something bad happens, people go, what are you going to do to react? React to this, would you? But nobody says proact. Proact is about thinking ahead, taking a step forward, thinking about it before it happens. How are we going to solve this problem? Right? Proact should be a verb. Why? So you can tell people to do something. Isn't proact also planning? It's all of it. You know, I mean, I, I can tell you where this came from. I was sitting on a, in a cab, 
uh, heading down to Penn Station. I had a meeting in Washington, and I was stuck in traffic, and I was going to miss my train. And I started to react, and my heart rate started to go, and I started to get uh, angry at the traffic. I started to get short-tempered. I started yelling at the cab driver, saying, can't you get me there any quicker? Why did you take this road? I knew the other road was quicker. You know, I'm going to miss my... And, I, and all of a sudden, I caught myself, and I realized that I can't control the traffic. And should the cab driver have taken another road or not is irrelevant. I'm on this road, you know, and this is, this is it, and I'm probably going to miss my train. That is the reality. And so I accepted that I was going to miss my train. I just accepted that the train was going to be missed. And then all of a sudden, I started proacting. I decided, okay, I'm going to miss my train. So what do I have to do? So I quickly called up the train and found out uh, what the next train was, right? So I could be prepared to, to take the next train. Then I immediately made a list of the meetings that would be affected if I got on the later train and um, got prepared I pulled all the phone numbers up and got prepared to call them up and let them know what happened. And even in my own calendar, tried to see where I could reorganize some of those people for the trip that I was going to be in D.C., right? All of a sudden, I relaxed, I sat back, and I enjoyed the sunny day outside. Mm -hmm. Because all of a sudden, even though, quote-unquote, something bad was about to happen, I already knew exactly what would happen if it happened. I got to the station, I ran and got my ticket, and I ran down. I was the last person on the train, and I made my train. Mm -hmm. And I never had to implement any of the plan. And the point was, I was relaxed, and that's probably why I made the train. Um, and so uh, proaction is about looking forwards. Reaction is about reacting to what happened backwards. And we need it as a verb. It doesn't exist. We must have the verb proact in our vocabulary. vocabulary. We use it. We use it uh, in my office. Like, we will say to each other, I need you to proact to this. Or something happened. I'll proact. I got it. Like, we, we use it as a verb, and it's amazingly powerful. So when people, when they go back, because sometimes people, what I see, please tell me where I'm wrong, but what I see is sometimes people will say they will get stuck in their story about what happened to them. Like, I, I mean, very easily I could say, oh, I had a bad childhood, so therefore I, had a bad, I have a bad life because I had this bad childhood. You know, I chose to do things differently in my own life, but sometimes people get stuck in, well, this is what happens to people like me. Mm -hmm. um, isn't that a reaction to maybe their history and their past? There's a quote that I live by. In fact, I printed it out, I printed it out on a label maker, and it's stuck next to my bed. Um, and it's a quote by Henry Ford. And he said, if you think you can or you think you can't, you're right. And we all look for reasons uh, that we can or can't do things. There are many people who had bad childhoods who made it perfectly fine in life. Mm -hmm. In fact, there are many people who have great childhoods who make nothing of themselves in life. Mm -hmm. And so which one's correct? Which one is more valuable? And we can say it's important to have this or it's important to have that. Mm -hmm. And the answer is it doesn't matter. It's you. It's you who are making the contribution, not your parents, not your background, not your upbringing, right? Yes, we all have things that, are, that happen in our lives that are bad. I could tell you a list of things that, that should derail me, you know? And sometimes I let it get to me. Sometimes I use those things as excuses when I do poorly. I sort of shrug my shoulders and say, well, it's obviously because of this. Right? Mm -hmm. Because my parents didn't do this. It's their fault. No, it's my fault. It's accountability. And none of us likes to really, at the end of the day, take responsibility for our own actions because it's much easier to say that somebody else or something circumstantial was responsible for our actions. At the end of the day, it's our life. It's our career. It's our job. They're our children. It's our family. And ultimately, we're responsible. And if we want to be happy, then we have to try and work to be that way. We can't blame others. Right? It's the, mm -hmm. it, it's the victim mentality. There's nothing more crippling than a victim mentality. I can't do something because nobody lets me. I can't do something because nobody wants me to. I am living proof that, that I, I, I'm not qualified for anything that I'm doing. You know? <laughs> I'm not. I, have, I, I did a talk once at a big company, and the first question raised was, what, what, are you what makes you qualified to do this? Right? Uh -huh. And my answer in front of this room of people was nothing. I have no qualifications for what I'm doing. I don't have any advanced degrees, none. I dropped out of law school, right? My, gr my grade, I teach at Columbia University, yet my GPA, I should probably just say this on the air, but here you go. My GPA in college wasn't good enough to get into my own class, right? <laughs> if I applied to my own program, they wouldn't let me in, right? Um, I have no formal training in anything I'm doing, and I've made no formal study 
uh, and I never set out to quote unquote wh- whatever um, people call me a leadership expert, right? Mm-hmm. I've made no formal study. Of, well, I never woke up one day and said, ah, I'm going to s- formally study leaders. N- I am not qualified for anything that I'm doing. I'm just naive enough to believe I can. <laughs> so right? you, you live the he- Henry Ford's uh, quote. I live Henry Ford's quote, right? I love what I do, mm-hmm. right? And I wake up every day with a clear sense of why I do it. And I will find the ways to do that. And some of them are in the weeds, and some of them are at high levels, but it doesn't matter. You know, I show up and do talks for fr- I did a talk last night. So let me just tell you my one week, right? Mm-hmm. This is, so on Monday, I spoke to the 40 top leaders of NASA. On, uh, sorry, that was Tuesday. On Wednesday, I spoke to 150 of the top leaders of Air Force recruiting. And then on Thursday, I spoke to uh, uh, 300 people at NIH, uh, National mm-hmm. Institute for, for Health, part of Health and Human Services, right? Mm-hmm. And then last night, I spoke to a room full of designers, and there, I think there were 10 people in the room. I, I do the stuff that I want to do, and I do the stuff that I love. It doesn't matter if it's big. It doesn't matter if it's if it, if it, if it, what it pays to me. It's about showing up and, 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 and giving to places that fulfill me. I wanted to do the event, so I did it. Right? They called me up and said, hey, would you do our event? And I said, sure. Mm-hmm. And there you go. Done. Right? And for me, the test is not the size of the audience or the size of anything or, or what they're offering. To me, the test is will this help me advance my cause? Mm-hmm. You know, if I talk to one person who only wants to talk to me because they just want to build their own personal little business, you know, and, the, and then I'm not probably going to go crazy out of my way to help them. If I can, I will, but I'm not going to go crazy in my way to do it because not that I don't want to help them. It's that the impact that they can have on the world uh, is small, mm-hmm. right? But I will help a small business person who has a passion for doing something in the world, who wants to contribute in a big way, and isn't, because I can tell you the number of emails I get is, can you please look at our website? We're trying to grow our business. Mm-hmm. I'm like, no. But if you said, can you please you know, look at our website, because we believe in the, we're having this impact on the world, and what we want to do is contribute to, you know, young children in the inner city who don't have the right education, and, we, and I grew up in this way. Then mm-hmm. you get my attention. Mm-hmm. I contribute to those who pay it forward. I contribute to those who, who help me advance my cause to inspire people to do the things that inspire them. That's my test. The hard part is I can't do everything because time is a real constraint, mm-hmm. you know, and this is the reason why we have a movement. This is the reason why... We need other people, not just me, to pick up this cause and talk about why and talk about what we believe. Because if it's just me, we're done, Mm -hmm. right? It's over because Mm -hmm. there are not enough hours in the day. And it is amazing how many others have started websites, started blogs, started companies that are helping people find their why, that are talking about the left-siders, they're building communities, and I'm uninvolved in all these things. And that's the only way that we're going to have an impact in the world is when people don't have to rely on me, when they can take it upon themselves or find each other. Mm-hmm. that's what I love about social movement is that we do it not for one person. We do it for ourselves. So there's all these tribes that are running around. They're running around. And I only know a small number of them. I, I, ho- I, I hope there's more, mm-hmm. you know, I only know the ones that care to email me and say, look what we're doing. Mm-hmm. And I go, cool. <laughs> well, I appreciate you taking the time out cause it is a long interview m- longer than most radio sh- shows are. So, but to come in and inspire my, my listeners, the people that, you know, my small tribe that I have of people that want to look at things and do things differently and are asking themselves why, you know, this is great information for them. So I really appreciate you taking the time out today. It's my pleasure. And I thank you for, for, for not only giving me a forum to share my ideas, but for showing people that if they live their lives for themselves and do what they love, that they'll find that everything that they want to achieve and all those goals that they sort of have aimed for are much easier to grasp. And it's, and it's your why that inspires me. So thank you very, very much. Simon, it's been great having you on the show today. I really appreciate it. I, I, thank you. This is Corinne Motokaitis. You've been listening to How She Really Does It on KDRT LP 95.7 FM. And my guest today was Simon Sinek, author of Start With Why, How Great Leaders Inspire Everyone to Take Action. Early.